My name is Pete Ziplon. I'm the Executive Director of the Logistics Innovation Center, which is uh, an industry-focused division of the Department of Economic Development. And uh, if you could bring up my slides, Kelly. Um, and so I've also had the two sides of my business card, if, you, if you'd like to get one later. Uh, the other side is uh, newly appointed as the program director for all of our strategic industries, right? So we have six strategic industries here in Georgia, um, agribusiness, uh, aerospace, logistics, advanced manufacturing, life science and IT, um, and, uh, and, and so I'm a, I'm a director of all six of those uh, centers scattered around the state, looking to create jobs and investment, and that's really what it's, what it's all about. Um, that's what logistics is all about. Um, so my role here today is just to talk about supply chain and logistics. I, I've got the, the pleasure to, to sort of tee up a few ideas for, for Michelle to follow up on and, and talk about her content as well. But I'm going to be pretty broad. Um, and the first thing I want to do was just, um, I'm going to go through the same thing, is, is sort of bring this up as, you know, why do we have to have meetings like this, right? I mean, it's simple. Logistics is about moving stuff point A to point B. We, we got, we've seen lots of pretty maps about freight flow. It's, it's pretty straightforward, right? Couldn't be further from the truth. It's really collaborative. It's really complicated. It's an ecosystem is the word I use, frankly, too much. Um, but it is. Everything's connected. If you, if you took the railroads out of the mix, the ports are impacted. If you took trains out of the mix, the airports are impacted. They're all connected. And my point here, and this is going to be sort of my theme for the, for the talk, is that you can't just put bigger tires on your moped and expect it to go faster, right? So as you think about your supply chains and your communities and your MPOs and whatever other acronyms you use to describe your neck of the woods, um, think about all the different things that go into moving freight from point A to point B. It's changing. It's changing really fast. It's changing faster now than, frankly, it has in the past three or four years just to put some sort of time horizon on it. Um, and it's changing in a lot of different ways. And, and they're just going to touch on a few of those things, and then it'll get out of your way and let you hear from some folks that actually move freight. Um, so the first thing is, is that if you ask your favorite economist, the U.S. population has about 300 million people in it. Um, it's grown since I just made that, that comment, and they, the economists like to put us in all these little different buckets. Um, some of them call us Generation Y and Baby Boomers and all these different things. But we all buy stuff, right? Hopefully a lot of it from the Home Depot. Not twice on Sundays. I made the mistake of saying that. We've got to get it done in one trip, which is true. But if you think about it, and, and again, economists say, which studies show, which make these numbers true, um, that by the year 2050, we're going to add about 4 billion more tons into, in many places, as we've seen in the maps, a pretty already pretty congested network of freight mobility networks um, and, and uh, corridors and all the different words they use to describe um, point A's to point B's. Um, about 100 million more people, pretty easy math problem. Um, how are we going to handle that from a regional perspective, from a state perspective? But it's also a national problem as well. I don't even think of it as a problem. It's really an opportunity. How do we capitalize on the jobs and investment that come from this new freight that's coming our way? And there's lots of different answers to how you do that, depending on where, where in the world you live. Um, but it's certainly an opportunity we want to take, a, take advantage of. You know, we talk about mega regions, and that's certainly true. If I sort of generalize that a little bit, if we think about people that buy stuff, as I, as I generally called it before, about 70% of those folks, like us, live in our neck of the woods. And I think I've captured all the, all the states that are represented here today. If you draw a line between Dallas and Chicago, over in our neighborhoods, about 70% of people that buy stuff live near us. Um, so we're in a great opportunity, and Georgia and Florida happen to be two of those fastest growing population pockets in the U.S., and that, a lot of reasons for that. Um, I, you know, I talked about consumers, and, and us as consumers, both as folks that, that buy stuff, and also um, people that use a lot of technology, um, we're impacting the way the supply chains are done. We can use the word e-commerce. That's so 2000s, right? Now it's m-commerce and s-commerce, and how to use Twitter to make money if you run a business. You know, supply chains are changing, and while we laugh about that, that is significantly impacting the way Home Depot and others are making decisions on where they're going to build that next distribution center and what the inside of that distribution center is going to look like. Um, so something to think about that I won't get into. This is called the Blackberry Prayer. Um, some of you will begin to do this um, here shortly. So my job and Michelle's is to keep you from doing as much of this as possible, uh, at least in the next hour or so. But what the, the people behind these Blackberries praying um, are called Generation Y. And, and what's important about this demographic or this bucket, about 80 million of those folks, of the 300 that are around today, know nothing but technology. Right? They, they've got devices, they've got iPads and Blackberries. Maybe not as much as the Blackberries, but iPads and iPhones probably be more uh, 2013 comment. Um, they are not only going to be driving consumers in the way that we make decisions on buying stuff, but they're also our workforce for the future. 
So how do you take advantage of this new workforce that all they know is technology, which is a good thing, and implement them into your supply chain <clears throat> and into your operations and into your business? Um, they're going to change the way that we do logistics, and they're the ones that can be driving the truck, literally. Um, you know, when we talk about technology growth, you know, a lot of folks think about, well, this is all 2050, and I get it. We need to project freight and stuff like that, too, out into the future so we can plan around it. Um, but, you know, one of my favorite statistics is in about a month, there will be more mobile devices on planet Earth than there are people. Um, and, you know, so quick question, who has iPhone? Who also has an iPad? So there's a lot of mobile devices. Why, I don't know. But um, there's a lot of mobile devices out there. Another staggering statistic that I think is interesting is that there are more, there are more mobile cell phone subscription plans than there are on planet Earth than there are people with access to clean water. So, so is there a way to use technology? And these people had access to the, the, uh, to the cell phone network. Can they use that to get access to clean water? You know, there's some, a lot of, we have a lot of work to do. And moving freight is, frankly, pretty trivial when we think about some of the larger problems that our, that our world is seeing. Um, just a few statistics, and you can read them from yourself. My favorite one is this bottom one that really states that this is just starting. You know, we joked about before that e-commerce is so 2000s, right? I, I challenge you to go find somebody that's never shopped online. I mean, think about it. You know anybody that's never really bought anything off the internet? Anybody here never shopped on the internet? I, I've done this a lot, right? And nobody's ever raised their hand. Maybe they're embarrassed to say that, but uh, nobody ever raised their hand. There's probably a couple here that haven't, but... But according to statistics, about five and a half million people, and this number continues to be true, five and a half million people every year figure out how to shop online for the first time. So this is the tip of the iceberg when we think about how e-commerce and technology is shaping our supply chains for companies like Genuine Parts and Home Depot and, and many others. Um, it is changing, um, and that infrastructure and the network they rely on is going to be changing as well. Um, before I make a couple of comments, anybody here work for Nike? You can buy some of the most hideous things off Nike, <laughs> NikeID.com. And that's not a slam against Nike. I've got a couple pairs myself. Um, but the point here is just to bring that, that changing world point home. Um, if you go to NikeID.com, everybody ever shopped at NikeID.com? A couple? I have a 13-year-old that plays soccer, right? And he wanted a specific shade of, of sneakers. He wanted his number on the side with, in a certain color with his team name and all that. And that's great. Um, and I figured we were going to pay triple for it. You can go to NikeID.com. Um, these are actually a pair of Dave's shoes. Um, you know, why Dave Williams would want a, a pair of shoes like that, I'm not sure. Probably. This one actually doesn't match his tie. But um, My point is, is that the supply chain, you think about behind the joking of it, um, it's not about buying a pallet of black cleats from China, having it shipped to your network and distributing it to your stores. That's hard enough. Ask Home Depot, right? It's about how do you manufacture that single pair of shoes and get it to your door within a reasonable amount of time at really no more cost on shipping and do that as a one-off product. So now you're talking about the meshing of, of supply chain and logistics with manufacturing. And that's really the, the change that's going to be coming our way no matter what kind of business you're in. Um, and Nike is just a great example of that. And they don't do that just to be cool and to take care of my son. They make a lot of money off it. Right? $100 million a year, and this is a dated number, just off that, that co-creation platform that they call it online. And I can tell you all the other shoe companies are doing the exact same thing, making a lot of money off this new wave of how do you use the internet um, to, to generate revenue. And so I mentioned manufacturing, and, and manufacturing doesn't look like this anymore, right? It's changing. Maybe some manufacturing looks like this, but um, nowhere in Georgia, I can assure you. Um, it's more like this, right? And so just another wave of things that are coming our way, and frankly, things that are already here is 3D printing. Anybody ever heard of? 3D printing, how we use plastics and polymers and titanium dust to create some pretty complicated um, devices. This woman here is making her cup of coffee in a much different way than we would think of. Um, but it's a two and a half billion dollar industry and growing 30% every year. If your business isn't part of that or if you're not thinking about how 3D printing is gonna impact your industry, um, you're, you're leaving something on the table because um, it's coming our way. What, one of the statistics was that I heard that um, 3D printing today is what laser printing was in 1980. You know, think about how many people have laser printers in their office today. You know, it's grown, and that's what 3D printing is going to become um, in, in just a short period of time. And you could do just about anything. And I, I don't know what the shoe fetish here is, but lots of shoes and, and clothes and, um, and assault weapons just to go from one end of the spectrum to the other. 
Um, you, can, you can manufacture just about anything with this 3D printing phenomenon. Again, changing and shaping the supply chains that we know today and into the future. Um, and, and where these things are coming from are, are, are changing even more. And I'm not going to uh, steal any uh, Curtis Foltz's thunder later on, but anybody know where this is? I figure this crowd wouldn't know. Right? It's the Panama Canal. And, and I used to, used to have a whole slide presentation. You could see the capacity of what's left in the Panama Canal, almost <laughs> literally. That's about the width of that laser dot. Um, and it's about, about six inches that are left where they hook the train up to the boat and drag it through the ditch. And that's the technical term for it. Um, but I mean, the, the, really, the Panama Canal is full. And in about 100 years, they haven't really made any improvements to the Panama Canal. Um, now, in about 2015, they're going to be adding a, another set of locks and making it wider and deeper to accommodate more cost-effective, um, more um, capable vessels that are going to service the East Coast. Um, that's going to, hold, again, change the shape of what our networks look like and a lot of the freight that's um, getting put onto our roads and into our rail. Um, this is a busy chart, <clears throat> and I put it up here because I assume that these slides will be available the afterwards. Um, this is a slide and a, a series of, of data points from the American Association of Ports Authorities. Um, and I think it does a really good job of listing out how this ecosystem, what it looks like from an infrastructure investment point of view. Because you know, while we can have fun talking about how supply chains are changing, and there is certainly a huge amount of opportunity in front of us with the advent of new technologies, we are woefully behind in, in the investment side of our infrastructure. And I think that's, that's a national issue. It's certainly true at different state levels. Um, we have to do a better job of investing in our infrastructure across the transportation network, um, bar none. Um, and the AAPA does a pretty good job of, of putting some of those statistics forward. And, and I pulled out a few, of my, a few of my favorites, and again, still pretty busy. Um, there's going to be about a $46 billion investment gap that ports are going to have to invest in their infrastructure to keep up. $46 billion by the year 2040 that it's going to need to be invested. Um, about $7 billion in added costs were already seen by, um, by companies using freight, like Home Depot and others, because of our shallow harbors. Um, in Savannah, it's not on our business car, but we're the shallowest port in the world. Um, still able to be competitive and, and move freight better, frankly, than many ports in the US. Um, but that shallow port is definitely an Achilles heel for us. Um, and again, it's a national issue, $7 billion of added cost. $20 billion spent annually by our, our, our freight railroads and adjacent riders here from Norfolk Southern. Um, significant amount of private contribution being made by our private sector partners. What are states doing to step up to match and, and invest in our rail networks? Because that's certainly going to be a, a growth area, not, not high or higher speed rail, freight rail, um, and how we move products to customers and the role that, that rail plays in that. Um, $27 billion in costs to U.S. businesses due to our deficient highways. And there are good places and bad places as far as where that infra infrastructure investment needs to be made. Um, it's not a uh, build a whole new highway network. It's not about building whole new six-lane roads. It's doing the best with what we have and improving in places where the data shows that investment needs to be made. So we've got to do a real scalpel approach um, regionally as well, and in many ways ignoring state boundaries on how we connect those dots. Because companies like Home Depot don't care. They don't, their truck drivers don't look down and see state boundaries when they deliver our product to a new distribution center, to a new, to a new customer. Um, so we've got to reflect that as well from our state and regional level. Um, and then the bottom statistic, $4 trillion in projected loss to US GDP by 2040, directly connected to lack of investment in our infrastructure here in the US. Significant. And, and I guess if I flip that around, the other side of this would be where if we think about supply and demand, right? If we're the demand side, our supply is coming from China. And, and I won't go into it, but look at the investment that's being made in our, in our Asian ports. Um, not our Asian ports, in Asian ports and in ports around the world that are shipping products our way. There's a serious uh, supply and demand gap between those, those two pieces of infrastructure. We've got to be ready. And I say we, as the transportation industry, have to be ready to accept that product. Um, so just to wrap things up, um, you know, a pretty complicated industry. From the industry side, if you move products, if you're Genuine Parts or, or Norfolk Southern or Home Depot, uh, the more stuff you move, the more profitable you'll be. And, and I'm sure they think it was, they wish it was that easy. Um, you've got to do it so the more volume you have, the better off you'll be. But you've got to do it at the right speed, not necessarily faster, but at the right velocity that matches up with your product. Um, and also have better visibility into how your operations run and visibility into where those products are moving um, in order to be um, competitive, cost efficient, and so on to, to move those products efficiently. Um, 
So how does that match up with sort of the private industry side and the right side of this is, is sort of the public side. If we're going to be moving more volume, I mentioned the 4 billion more tons um, coming our way. How does that volume match up with the capacity that states and the nation is putting in place? Is there a connection there? Are those parties talking about where that capacity needs to go? Um, and it, again, it's not about building just new six lane roads. Um, you need to have the right kind of capabilities. Is the, is the freight rail network double stacked and, and weight um, bearing in the places it needs to be? Are the highways connected to the places where they need to go? And that sort of brings up that last C is connectivity. Um, if we're just building roads just to build them, whether they're driven by politics or other reasons, they've got to connect into um, these pockets of population. Talked about that a little bit. Um, and they've got to connect into where customers are demanding products. Um, so those are just a few thoughts. And my, one of my favorite quotes is, this isn't easy, right? These opportunities, this opportunity of added freight, and along with it, the jobs and investment that come our way, um, it's hard work. And opportunities are often missed because they're dressed in overalls and look like hard work. Um, my last slide is, is that I, I mentioned faster, better, or cheaper. Um, you know, if you ask a company, that's really what they want. They've got to have it faster, it's got to be better, and it's got to be cheaper. Most supply chain professionals will tell you, you can normally pick two if you're doing it pretty good. Um, I would submit that reliability is the key, right? Before you can start having a conversation, if you're in an MPO or whether you're a trucking company, regardless, you're, you're kind of wasting your time if you're focusing on faster, better, cheaper, if you can't plan it. Right? If you don't have reliability, if your supply chains are really exciting, um, you're doing something wrong. Supply chains um, are supposed to be pretty boring. And don't take that the wrong way. Um, but if they're boring, that means they're reliable. And then you can begin to eke out and have a more serious conversation about doing it faster, doing it better, and possibly doing it cheaper as well. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Paige. Um, so Paige works with a lot of the company, really all of the companies that are logistics companies that we're trying to uh, recruit, expand, work with from an economic development standpoint here. So that's a broad viewpoint. Michelle uh, is going to bring us right down to the treetop level, right to the store shelf level, and talk about what their operations, what their supply chain logistics look like. We already heard from Mike earlier today. Um, and let me also not fail to point out, earlier today we had Chairman John Eves, who serves on the National Freight Advisory Committee, appointed by Secretary LaHood. And Michelle is also a member of that committee, and so uh, thank you for joining us. And uh, we don't have, uh, at least at present, I don't think anybody from UPS is here, but UPS Freight is also a member of our chamber that has served on that committee as well. So we have, we have, yeah, exactly. So we have three people. We're proud uh, from a chamber standpoint that we have three people that are involved, engaged in that federal policy standpoint. So without further ado, Michelle, tell us about all about Home Depot. I would love to. While I'm just popping down here by a show of hands, who has shopped at the Home Depot in the last week? Everybody raise their hands. <laughs> OK, that was a good test. Taking notes. Yeah, I am. That's OK. And how about who has ordered an online order from Home Depot? HomeDepot.com. Ooh, I'd like to see more of that. All right, so maybe we'll talk about that in more detail in just a minute. So uh, as Dave said, I'm just thrilled to have the opportunity to share the Home Depot story. For those of us who are supply chain professionals, there has been no better place to be than the Home Depot uh, as we have gone through our supply chain transformation. It has just been a very exciting place. I joined uh, Home Depot at the end of 2007 after a lengthy career at Kraft Foods and JCPenney. And uh, to be able to come in ground floor and be part of such a transformational change is just been just fabulous. It's about all I can say. But one of the things that keeps us really humble is we remember where we have been. And for anyone who has seen Mark Holyfield, who is my boss, he's the SVP of supply chain for Home Depot present, this is a common chart. And we like to show this because it's a good reminder that back in 2007, which was just a mere six years ago, we were basically having thousands of vendors ship to 2,000 stores. And that was, the, that was the process. Home Depot had made a decision um, as it was growing uh, that the emphasis was going to be on the stores, absolutely the right place to be. And it was up to the vendors to figure out how to get their product into our stores. And uh, you know, as, when there were only a handful of stores and a handful of vendors, that worked out pretty well. But you can imagine the complexity, particularly from a store perspective, as every vendor is trying to ship to the store. Um, and with basically LTL, we were the largest LTL user in the country, not necessarily what we wanted to be. Um, so really, part of our supply chain transformation is to figure out how to serve our stores more efficiently. And that's what I'm going to share right now. So if you just take a quick look at that chart, you'll see that 
um, at the time, in 2007, we had about 60% um, of our product going direct to store. The other stuff was uh, primarily, uh, I'd say, marked to ship for a store. Um, so the vendors uh, would ship into a transit facility. Uh, we also did have imports, and we had a separate import distribution network as well. So 80% um, of the store SKUs were ordered by the store. And when you think about 2,000 stores, there were literally 35,000 people that could place an order to get product into Home Depot. It is very difficult to, to control your inventory when you have 35,000 people that can independently decide what they want in their store. So you can, I think, appreciate the need for change. So um, moving forward, yeah, Kayla, thank you. I do better when I can talk with my hand anyway. Okay, so this is our current network. So we still have a product that's going direct to store, but it's only about 25% of our product goes direct to store. And that's stuff that we really can't add value to. Live goods, really don't want to put those through the distribution network. Uh, we've got cement and some other things that we really don't want to put that through the distribution center. But we are now about 75% as going through a centralized distribution center, and we have a centralized inventory planning and management uh, center that is basically controlling all those orders. So it's been a tremendous tremendous value. So we really, if we go to the next slide, you'll see that we flow product in a couple different ways. We still go direct to store when that makes sense. Um, we have a rapid deployment center, uh, which we call the RDC. A lot of people think that stands for Regional Distribution Center, but that is not correct. It is Rapid Deployment Center, and I'm going to talk about more because that's really where our transformational change has been. And then we still have stocking distribution centers. Where before it had been just for import product, now we can actually do domestic goods in there too for things that we want to quickly replenish, um, the, particularly for seasonal items. And then we do have a lumber uh, and bulk distribution center that basically goes on flatbeds to our stores as well. So that's the four ways that products flow through our distribution network at this point in time. And if we go to the next slide, um, you'll see that the big transformational change for our RDCs is the fact that instead of having each store place an order with the vendor, our inventory planning group basically takes the aggregate demand for all the stores that are served by a distribution center and, and aggregates that up and then places one large order uh, from the vendor to the distribution center and then the RDC breaks down and allocates product to the stores as it's needed. So it's taking us about nine days um, to get product from the time we place the order to the time it's actually in the store and on the shelf. It's about a nine day uh, process at this point in the time. And the really big Big thing is that we're not holding any product at the RDCs at all. That is flow through. So basically, it's coming in one side of the building and going out the other side. And uh, that's been a huge transformational change for us. So moving on, um, here's a map of our distribution centers. Uh, you'll see that um, probably our activity is a lot where the activity is for every other major retailer in the country. Um, you'll see that we're clustered, obviously, in the Northeast and on the West Coast. Um, and I want to call out uh, the green circles, which are on the, on the coasts. Those are our new transload facilities. So in 2010, we, uh, and we were not on the bleeding edge of this concept, by the way, uh, but we did open up a transload facility on the West Coast, which was tremendous, because if anyone remembers 2010, <laughs> that was the year the ocean carriers uh, decided to uh, really wreak havoc in the industry and basically uh, six more months of therapy and I'll be all cured is about all I can say from all that. I mean, we survived it, we did well, but um, there was a more demand and capacity at the time and it created a, a lot of challenges for us. But we that actually started was the start of our transo facility. So we have a four corner strategy for our imports and, um, and it's working out really well because what that's allowing us to do is to aggregate demand to four centers and then again, our RPR group is able to allocate product to the right distribution centers three days prior to vessel arrival, and that way we can make sure that we've got product in all the right places. So it's been a tremendous value to us. And you'll see Savannah, so when Curtis is here, Savannah's one of our favorite ports. In fact, it is our favorite port. So you can let him know that Home Depot still loves him tremendously for all the great service that we get from the port of Savannah. So let's move to the next chart. So this is our RDC service map. So each RDC serves somewhere between about 100 and up to 145 stores. And we have uh, 18 RDCs at this point in time. We started off with 19. We closed the one in Brazelton and reallocated uh, 
to other uh, to other RDCs to serve some of the stores that uh, Brazelton had been serving. So um, I'm sure this looks uh, very similar because it kind of mirrors the mega region maps in a way uh, where those activities are taking place. Um, but you know you see that we have a fairly large geographical area um, that we're serving from each of the RDCs. Can you see page? Okay. So uh, let's move to the next slide. So. One of the, you know, we're not going to rest on our laurels. The RDCs have certainly been a tremendous value. It's uh, we've been able to prove to the stockholders um, that the value of our supply chain and the investment that was made in the RDCs was certainly well spent. But we're not sitting back and resting on our laurels. And so we are continuously looking at how we can move product better. In our RDC network, we service stores about four and a half times a week. So we're shipping product from the distribution center to the stores so that we are continuously replenishing, which has helped our out of stocks tremendously. In the stocking distribution center, we're only serving stores about one to one and a half times a week. And since that seasonal product, basically if we're trying to replenish sales from the weekend, get inventory back in before the following weekend. But what we're trying to do is say, hey, what's a more cost-effective way of getting those items that are in the stocking distribution centers to the stores more cost-effectively? And the concept that um, we're piloting right now is called two-tier. So basically, we're going to have an, a stocking distribution center ship in full pallet quantities to the RDC. Again, inventory will be reallocated out to the stores, and we'll combine the RDC product that had flowed in with the stocking distribution centers, and basically we'll be able to service the stores more frequently with the products that were in the stocking distribution centers without hitting them up with an additional truck. You know, it's all about labor in the stores, and they would much rather have that labor serving you as customers than they would having to unload trucks knocking on the back door. So um, this concept we're trying on the West Coast, uh, we think we like it. Um, we're gonna continue testing it in a few more places to make sure. Um, but I think it's one of just many ideas that we're pursuing uh, to ensure that our supply chain stays very, um, very competitive. So moving on, um, I want to talk a minute about our direct fulfillment buildings. You know, online is uh, definitely a growing part of our business. It, today, it only accounts for 2% of our sales. Um, so it has a way to go to before it catches up with core, but we recognize that 50% of the time of a store sale actually has occurred online. Customers are going online, they're checking out, um, at getting questions answered, and uh, they're doing a lot of research before they ever step into the store. So we are in the process of revamping our direct fulfillment um, network, which is very exciting. Um, you'll see the stars indicate where um, our distribution centers will be for direct fulfillment. We are keeping them separate from our core business. Um, and the star that's in Georgia is actually in Locust Grove. So we are uh, in the process of um, completing a brand new building. It's absolutely beautiful. I'm going to show you pictures here in a minute. Um, but we think that investing in our online network is going to be tremendous uh, benefit for us going forward. So if we move to the next slide, um, here is the external picture of Locust Grove. It doesn't look that exciting right there, but if you've had an opportunity to see it, um, it is fabulous. So if there's ever a tour, um, either through the chamber or elsewhere, that where you have a chance to see this building, it's, it is tremendous. Um, it's very automated, and it's really, if we move to the next page, I think it's, it shows you even better. These are just snippets. This is when the building wasn't even done, but you'll see lots of technology to figure out how we can flow the product through that building um, very quickly. And, you know, basically, if you order a patio set and a hammer, those are stored in two different places in the building, and yet we want to be able to combine that order for you at one time. So part of the challenge in the direct fulfillment building is how to marry those two shipments up so that basically, you know, you from a customer perspective, you can get one delivery. And so a lot of thought and effort's been put forth in trying to figure out how to make that happen and also figure out how we can um, deliver to customers the least expensive way, most reliably, and, uh, very, uh, and meet our transit times. So there's a quick uh, picture of our Locust Grove facility. If we move on to the next slide, I just want to talk about a minute about transportation. Transportation is my passion. I have been in transportation for 150 years, um, and it's it's transportation's been very good to me. So I just wanted to sh just share that our average freight expense uh, on an annual basis exceeds the sales revenue of companies like Ann Taylor, Pep Boys, and a couple others. So we spend a lot in freight, and uh, it, as steward and 
budget keeper of that, I wanna make sure that we're spending it most effectively. So we still have about 13% of our uh, spend in LTL. So that's, um, that's still important to us. I don't want you to think that we've totally taken LTL out of the, our portfolio, portfolio. That's not true. There's certainly a way to make that uh, cost effective for us. We are the third largest import um, in the US. Um, we're behind Walmart and Target. We like to say we'd be ahead of Target, but we, we ship more effectively than they do. That's what I like to say. <laughs> I don't know they're buying what I'm selling, but that's what I like to say. And from a delivery perspective, that's our, that's our, um, our customer delivery side. So um, by the way, Black Friday is literally just around the corner uh, to, yes, literally. Um, and tomorrow actually starts our appliance sales, by the way. And it, through the month of, and I only share this with you. Brought coupons for everybody. I wish I did. The <laughs> deals are fabulous. I just, I've just i seen them, and I wish I needed new appliances because it would be <laughs> worth it. But the real reason that I'm sharing that with you is that uh, my group's responsible for making about 3.3 million appliance deliveries a year. So, um, and if you're, and when you take advantage of those great Black Friday deals, buy early because you know, capacity is gonna be a little tight. And I'm just saying, I don't wanna get notes from you just saying, Michelle, I ordered an appliance. I wanna know where it is. You told me it was a two week out delivery. I'm telling you now, buy early. The deals don't get any better. Don't, so if you're waiting until actually Black Friday, I've already been told, deals are no better. But we, in addition to 3.3 million um, appliance deliveries, we do about 1.2 million deliveries from store to a job pro site or to a customer's home. So if you wanna build a deck this weekend, that's part of my group's responsibility as well. On the bottom row, when you, took, you take a look at truckload and dedicated and intermodal, those are all really near and dear to our hearts as well. Intermodal is growing. And the reason that intermodal is growing is because we've been able to get that consistent and transit time that we've been looking for. You know, it's, it does us no good to deliver six days one time, four days the next, uh, seven days, five days. We are looking for that consistent transit time. And through a lot of hard work with our rail partners and our IMCs, that's happening. And so we're really excited about that. So I only share this information with you because I, I feel like I am a customer of all of you in this room because every decision that you make impacts my world directly in some form or fashion. So let's move on. So, um, and to that end, we also hold our service providers. Uh, we use all third-party carriers. We are not a private fleet operator like Walmart. Um, and so we rely heavily on all the third-party services and we evaluate them on their service. And we give them zero slack. So if there is construction, if the road was closed, if there was congestion, talk to the hand. Don't care. <laughs> uh, we expect our product to arrive on time, whether it's at the distribution center or it's at our store. And we do that because we are aligning our labor to match the arrival of that truck. And, or, and if that doesn't happen, then clearly we are, we're spending money unnecessarily. So I just wanted to just leave with you that service is paramount for us. We evaluate every carrier, we, we rack and stack, and every week they get a scorecard on their performance. And we make decisions. If you don't hit the threshold, you don't get to participate in future bids, and obviously you can lose the business entirely. So, um, so again, the decisions that y'all are making and how it impacts and the, how we deal with congestion and how we choose to invest our dollars and in our infrastructure um, definitely impacts the way we do business. And we want to make sure that the product is on the shelf when you go visit the store. And uh, I think on that note, um, I'll turn it back over to Dave. Thanks. Wow. wow. All I can say is wow. Um, fascinating information. And the thing that I think really is driven home to me is how quickly, and Michelle probably, you, maybe you shouldn't say this, maybe I shouldn't say it either, but I think Home Depot was not nearly as sophisticated from a supply chain standpoint when you arrived and when Mark arrived as it is now. It's been an unbelievable, you wouldn't believe uh, the transformation. Yeah, I have to tell you that when you come in from the outside and you come to Home Depot, at particularly in the two seven, 2007 era, you wouldn't think that an $80 billion retail or didn't have certain core things. I mean, that just was a big surprise. But then you have to remember that, again, this, the decision had been made to invest. So it is fabulous that the company, even during times of recession, chose to invest in supply chain and uh, took that opportunity for us to revamp. Because frankly, if we would have been trying to do that at the peak of business, that would have been a really difficult transition. But we had that uh, ability where volume was down a little and we seized that opportunity. And uh, I think it's very impressive that Home Depot chose to continue to invest in supply chain when a lot of folks were doing the opposite. So so to tie that into what we heard from uh, from Mike Orr, 
Um, the speed at which the business decisions are being made is incredibly rapid, and it's being driven by the response, by driven by the cultural factors that Paige detailed, which is the uh, the internet, mobility, uh, the neat mobile data, which Atlanta is the ground ground zero for mobile data. But that's really driving a lot of the decision making that it ultimately businesses. Um, um, uh, really are held accountable to in, in how, and how they're structuring their business. And so I think that, that's one thing that I've already heard so far. Um, let me do this. I don't want to just necessarily have a conversation. I want the conversation to be broader. Are there questions either for Paige or for Michelle about anything that they've um, shared with you so far or maybe even, uh, you know, what, things that Mike had talked about? Um, and we'll just go, we'll start on the left side. Janine? From Greta, why don't you go ahead and we're going to bring you a microphone so that we can make sure everybody can hear and we can also hear on the uh, tape. Thank you. Thank you for your presentations. Love being able to interact with uh, the, the private sector pressures and ways we can support uh, that work that you all do. Because that's our job, as you say, you know, to serve you as our customers. Um, you, you, Michelle, you broke down the spend of uh, transportation by mode. I wonder what's the volume because you know intermodal at, at, with rail at eight percent it may um, not be fully indicative of how important rail is for your for your business, and in fact may indicate that that is such a, a cost efficient way of moving freight that we should potentially give more attention to it on the public sector side. So, it, do you have a comparison of of also the volumes, whether it's by load or value or volume that's moved by the by the um, different modes as opposed to just the spend? Yeah, um, sir. Certainly, I was trying to give a magnitude for the loads, but we do a minimum of about 10,000 loads a week into our distribution centers. And likewise, what comes in goes out, so it's, a, it's almost uh, comparable on the outbound side. And on the inbound, which is where we primarily use the intermodal, it actually accounts for almost 20% of our inbound volume. So it is very important to us. We're also doing some intermodal on, uh, on store loads as well from our Lake Park, Georgia, uh, RDC to stores in Florida um, because you know it's kind of a no man's land once you get to Florida folks you know truckers have trouble getting it out getting out of there so the intermodal has been a tremendous thing so yes we should continue to invest in all intermodal opportunities and making sure that that it continues to be a, an efficient and viable way to ship product. Alfred Bowers Federal Highway um, I often call Home Depot my second home we like that. I'm there all the time. So I just wondered, have you ever considered shoppers' cards like the grocery chains do? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, they can track who bought what, when they oh, bought it. When they, oh, to, to track what aisles you go down and if you backtrack or anything? Uh, sort of like the grocery stores do when you go you're speaking to some, cards. Yeah. You're speaking to someone who doesn't actually go to the grocery store. So, okay. uh, yeah, so <laughs> I don't cook. But we haven't yet, but I will certainly take that back. Okay. <laughs> The answer probably no, because I would have one if they did. So. Yeah. All right, let's. Uh, we'll, get, we'll go to the back here, and we'll, uh, Laura will bring you a mic. Oh, you have a mic. Hi, I'm uh, Thomas Hammett from uh, Georgia Tech. Uh, first of all, thank you for both of your presentations, and uh, my question is to uh, Michelle. Um, I was struck when you said that uh, MPOs are. Um, you're basically your customers of uh, each of these MPOs. So I'm just wondering from your perspective, what can uh, MBO, MPOs and uh, state DOTs do right now to um, improve your supply chain efficiency? Yeah, I, I think, again, it goes back to consistency. So anything that we allow um, and invest in to ensure a more consistent transit time is huge because when we have volatility in transit time, that's when we start carrying more safety stock. That's when we start bringing in additional labor. That's when we start making decisions saying, well, I don't know if what's going to happen, so I'd better be careful because obviously we're not going to do anything on the end of the supply chain that's going to impact a customer. So that would be one way that I would encourage um, everyone to continue to think about the consistency. And fast, speed, and reliability are definitely key plays. I mean, one of the things uh, I think Mike spoke about earlier, uh, is, uh, they do probably more same-day deliveries than we do, but um, we're working toward programs, particularly online, where if you want it within a couple of hours and you're willing to, to pay a little more for that delivery, 
that's going to be an option. If you can wait till tomorrow, that'll be great. If you give us three to five days, then you might get it for free. Um, but when you're offering a customer something and they're paying you top dollar for that, you had better well be able to deliver on that. And again, if, we're, if we cannot rely on that transit time, knowing that we can get to that customer in a certain amount of time, that's, gonna, that's going to uh, force us to reconsider the offerings that we can do for our customers. Uh, Kent had a question, or Haley? I'm okay, Michelle, actually, I'm uh, sorry, right uh, behind. I'm with you, my sir, from Federal Library. Michelle, this question for you, actually, I, I can like to spin this question in two ways. Uh, the first question is kind of a piggyback because the previous gentleman asked that question. Instead of that, uh, if the, you know, the cost is always your, your critical decision, uh, if you have to you know, shrink the cost, let's say, next three to five years to, let's say, half a percent, uh, what, what the, the public agency can help you in to make that in a streamline? I, I know you just said that reliability is the one thing. Uh, probably tie that thing to, uh, you know, your carriers or you know, third party you know, uh, carriers. What would you listen from them? Uh, in terms of uh, a, a compliant or issues, uh, I'm sure you you have the demand of zero uh, tolerance of uh, in delaying. I'm sure they have something that they would share with you. Is that possible to share with us so that we can address this? It could be in a uh, some kind of a hours of operation issues, or maybe a, the local government, uh, you know, uh, regulations issues. Any of those things would be appreciated. Sure. So, did you have something you wanted to add? No, to? no. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, by all means, all the regulations impact, you know, the hours of service, CSA, all those things that, uh, you know, I think folks go in with the right spirit in terms of how they come about. Um, not all of them necessarily are, are as uh, business uh, supportive as we would like. Um, I think that, um, you know, I, th I would just encourage that um, as decisions are being made, uh, to check in with that final customer, you know, and uh, make sure that the decisions that are being made truly are conducive for a good business, is what I would encourage. But yes, there's definitely things, um, you know, just whether I'm trying to think of some some more minor ones, um, skirting on trailers, good idea, bad idea, not really sure. Um, you know, we'd like to think they are helping with fuel economy, that kind of stuff, but. I don't know, but I know it's an investment carriers have had to make. So, you know, again, I think everyone goes in with the right idea. I just think that we we just need to pause and have a, a reasonable test to make sure that it's actually going to drive business in a positive direction, along with safety. I mean, we're very safety oriented. We, we wouldn't want to do anything to compromise safety. You know, if I could just add I mean, to both of your questions and from what we've talked broader than the Home Depot, but talking to industry in general and some stuff that Janina Gina and I have worked on here in the state of Georgia is, you know, maybe it's just a question for you guys as MPOs. How many of you have industry advisory committees that, that are from the freight perspective? Um, I, know, I know Atlanta does and some do. And, and then I guess for those of you who raised your hands and those who didn't, those industry advisory folks, these folks like Home Depot that you bring to the table, if you're doing that, and I don't think everybody is, but if you're bringing industry to the table, are you telling them what your plans are or are you asking them what, what, the, what the challenges are and how we can respond? Because I think those are two different conversations and I think that's critical. And if you're not asking industry, what can we do to be a better partner to private industry, um, you're, you're making it up, right? Frankly, just to be a little flip. But um, I think so you need to engage people like Michelle in your next of the woods and have them really sit at the table and ask them what, your chal what, the, what challenges they're facing and how you can respond. And that was kind of both of your questions. What can MPOs do to help companies reduce costs? Ask them. Question for Michelle. Um, with regards to congestion and Home Depot's operations and your transportation providers, where are you seeing the biggest impact in your business uh, that, that congestion is causing? Yeah, the biggest issue with congestion for us is delivery to stores. Um, the stores have a very tight delivery window, and we're often trying to um, do multi-stops, deliver at one store, and then deliver to the next one. And again, the stores are aligning labor oftentimes with the arrival of that truck. And so whether it's an accident, which obviously is not something that you can really plan for, or if it's true, um, you know, just 
pure traffic, which we tend to be able to plan for better, but we don't like it, because at least in our modeling, we can reduce the miles per hour in our modeling and gauge how long it's gonna take us to get there. But it really, it's really to the store impact because that labor is so critical to success. And our distribution centers, I don't wanna say that it's not as important, but we're primarily a drop trailer in our distribution center. So it, you know, if they're, they're an hour late, um, frankly, it's not gonna impact the operation like it does in the store. I had a question about toll roads. Uh, that's a, a big issue in public sector these days. I know no, no shipper likes to pay tolls. I mean, we understand that. But the, the concept of toll roads, at least for the most part, is that a, a new, especially a new toll road, um, would often, if not always, offer a more reliable, uh, predictable travel time. And what I've been hearing today a lot of is, is the, the value of predictability. So I'd like to get both of your senses on that, that trade-off of paying tolls versus the, the value of the additional reliability. I, th I think what we've heard, I think broadly, that you know, toll roads are, are, are good. I think the flexibility is what I think most truckers and shippers want. They don't want to be told they have to, like truck only toll lanes kind of environment where they want to have the option to, to use a, a route if it makes sense for that particular delivery and, and they'll weigh the costs and the benefits accordingly. Uh, but yeah, I think, I think that reliability is the key factor. And if, if a toll road um, creates that reliability, whether it's for truck only or whether it's for a broader um, community of drivers, including transit, that's, that's something that MPOs and states need to explore. Uh, Atlanta and Georgia have certainly explored many different iterations of, of trying to do that and, and it put some very successful things in place that I think are beginning to see some, some benefit. Um, so I think tolls can be an option, but they're not a, they're not a, a magic bullet of any sort. So. I would agree. The only thing that I would add is that we spend a lot of money in tolls. Um, the, the, the decisions that are made to increase a toll on short notice um, is very painful for us. So, I mean, if we know we can plan for it, then we can do other, uh, if we choose not to pay the toll and we want to take alternate routes, we have that opportunity to study that and all that kind of stuff. So I would just say, you know, and we, we budget twice a year. Um, which is, just makes it all year long a, a budgeting process, um, and, by the way. Uh, but it, at least it does allow us to incorporate changes like that into our financial model. Dr. Ross? Yeah. Cool. In the back. Okay. So, so I want you to speculate for a moment. You've already alluded to it, but think about um, where you sit now. What do you see as possible tipping points? I know we, we don't have a crystal ball, but just think for a moment about what might be tipping points from both of the vantage uh, uh, points you sit at now. What, what do you think some of those things might be? And some of these are unforeseen, I know, you don't know. But would you just dig a little deeper, or think a little harder, and see what some of those might be? Each, I'll let you go on that one. Okay, thank you. Uh, tipping I'm points. thinking, <laughs> I'm processing. Okay. <laughs> Um, yeah, I, I mean, I guess some of the things we hear from industry is, is regulation. I think regulations, we're just now seeing, hours of service as an example, just really, just now coming online and beginning to see an impact on operations. I think as we see more regulations come on board, um, hopefully the, the right spirited ones and have um, the right kind of impact on industry, um, I think that could be a serious tipping point for, for good or bad. Um, and I'm concerned about that, and I think a lot of companies and the doubt um, that the federal government, the shutdown, and the, the doubt that I think is in people's minds um, on the ability to put regulations and policies in place that, that really have a positive impact on industry is, is a challenge. And that doubt puts uncertainty and, and decreases the reliability they have on, on, um, on moving their products. And so, on. so I think regulations is going to be, can be, um, hopefully won't be a negative tipping point, but um, could certainly be a big impact on, on industry. Um, that, that could cut across a variety of things, whether it's environmental, whether it's hours of service operationally and so on, that's just one. And now I'll get back to her why I think. No, I really like that answer, that was, that was good. I, I would add, I think fuel is a tipping point in some cases, I think um, as price of fuel, if it should go back up to where it was, I think that drives um, a lot of behaviors uh, from both our customer's perspective and how we react to things. Um, but definitely, uh, yeah, the, the regulations definitely you know, drive us into certain decisions. And frankly, you know, volume drives us to do certain things as well. I mean. Uh, you know, the last few years we've been in, in uh, 
you know, a reclining uh, volume perspective. Um, th now we're, at, and definitely, you know, sales have been tremendous. And, uh, you know, it's interesting to see what that does and how we approach things. And, you know, in some cases, it makes things a lot easier. Volume hides a lot of sins, um, and it's a beautiful thing. Uh, on the other hand, it can also uh, highlight where your, your weaknesses are um, and, and where we have to do things a lot differently. And, you know, and then it just highlights throughout the supply chain where your opportunities might be. We have a question at the back, and then we probably have time for about three more questions. So we'll do one, two, three, okay? All right. Yes, sir. I guess quick, que quick question for Michelle. You talked about reliability and that you plan for congestion and so forth, but congestion isn't consistent. What happens if all of a sudden you can move a lot faster and you hadn't planned for that? <laughs> I mean, I know I know it sounds like good news, but given your your whole issue with the labor force and, and right. so forth, right? Actually, um, early deliveries in our store network really don't help us all that much um, because the labor is not there. Right. So when you, it's like uh, when school is out of session and then suddenly you know you're riding at top speed on 75. It's a beautiful day, um, but that doesn't necessarily mean equate to good things. You know, the truck might wind up having to sit. Um, which doesn't really reward the driver for but the way he wants. So again, it's consistency, right? But it's I mean, consistency, yeah. The right speed, the right velocity. Absolutely. All right, so I want to follow up on, with this question for Paige. You said that essentially the question about MPOs, or well, what MPOs can do for the private industry, I know that when we've asked that, uh, that question, uh, we've you know, tried to convene a freight stakeholders group in, in our region, when we've asked that question, uh, one of the things that really jumped out to us is that the speed of business and the speed of government are two different things. And, really? <laughs> and, uh, I've heard you know, that before. <laughs> you know, but I mean, basically, you know, I think you know, the comment that we mostly get is like, "Give us the money and get out, of, you know, get out of our way." You know, um, how? I mean, in places where the the private advisory um, councils have been successful. I mean, how, uh, what sort of interaction um, do you have with those? Like, you know, I guess, you know, you brought up ARC a couple times. Mm -hmm. I mean, but, you know, what's, what's made that a success for the private industry, you know, and essentially kind of, you know, made ARC an asset for you? Sure. Well, yeah, and ARC certainly is, has been a great asset for the state of Georgia. A lot of volume and freight moving through, through this, this neck of the woods. I, I think broadly at the state level as well, um, we, we have a statewide freight and logistics plan that ARC participated in and helped shape and, and continues to shape. Um, that, that, air, that statewide freight and logistics plan was new for Georgia. It's a business plan for how we need to move freight. Frankly, we didn't have one before at a state level. Um, so starting from that level and going down, and frankly, I think ARC was ahead of the curve when we compare it to the state um, in many ways. When you look at freight planning, they're doing things at more of a, a, a regional level. Um, but so we now have a statewide freight and logistics plan, Home Depot and a, and a variety of Coca-Cola and a lot of the good Georgia companies that we're lucky to have here played a very active role in helping shape that, shape that conversation. Um, you know, the question was simple. What can we as a state of Georgia do to be a better partner to private industry? I don't have any trucks. You do, right? What do we need to do, to, whether it's pace of business? Okay, well then what specifically are the things that are slowing you down? Well, you know, we're not gonna change government, right? But if there's particular things that are impacting the way you move freight and causing you to not grow your business and not invest in new jobs and investment in our, in our state, you need to take a look at those. And realistically, some of those things you can change. Some of those things take a little bit longer. Um, but asking those questions and really taking those back to leadership, and I think that's a key word, is that you've gotta have leaders that that are really listening and willing to take some action to put them in place. So I would be open in asking those questions. Don't bring your industry folks together and tell them what you're going to be doing. Don't preach to them and look for their approval. You're wasting their time. And I think that would be a good trip or whatever neck of the wood you live in, what company you bring forward. So that's been successful for us here in Georgia. And we've seen some legislative actions and things that have been put in place um, at the state level. Freight and a freight network that's now in place that's um, changing the way that we I mentioned a scalpel approach on a freight investment. That's, that's now a reality for Georgia, um, Atlanta included. Um, so there's some, there's some real exciting things that are coming out of that, that interaction with private industry. Uh, we had w uh, one right here. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, um, Hi, I'm Elizabeth Vason from Georgia Tech. Hey. And I was wondering about ports. I know you talked about the, the expansion of the Panama Canal and the fact that we're going to need to spend billions of dollars to keep our ports up to date, to dredge them, et cetera. 
Uh, I know on the East Coast especially, there's a lot of competition between ports. Is that a good thing? Should all the ports be dredged? Is it, um, you know, or do we really, is it really necessary to spend all the billions of dollars to get every single port up to date or all the ones that are big enough to be dredged? Yeah, I think if you look at supply chains today, and I'll, I'll pick on Home Depot, you, you move freight through a lot of different ports. Savannah's one of those. Um, and if you look at the overall volumes, you know, we don't have the money to dredge all the ports. I think if you go back to that, that scalpel approach, so you prioritize, right? Where is the best investment made? And there's a lot of different parameters and ways you can look at it. One of the ways is to look at who's moving the most freight. How, how, which ports are moving in companies like Home Depot, which, which of those companies rely more on certain ports? And, and if you take the top rankings, you look at LA Long Beach, it doesn't have dredging issues. There's an expression in the port industry, this is true for logistics, when you've seen one port, you've seen one port. They're all very different. The operational infrastructure in LA Long Beach is very, very different than it is here in the southeast, very different than it is in New York, New Jersey. And they have different volumes and different challenges. Labor, just to pick one. Um, so LA Long Beach is moving a lot of volumes, doesn't have deepening issues. Um, at New York, New Jersey, they have a big bridge they need to move, either get it a lot higher or take it a lot lower. Um, that, that needs um, New York state monies. That can't, that's not a federal project. So there's different, I'm just pointing out a couple. And then the port right behind LA Long Beach in New York, New Jersey is the Port of Savannah, fourth largest port in the country. So if you look from a volume perspective and you're taking that scalpeled approach, now I am a little biased, but um, I think that would be the first place. Plus we've been studying that project for 17 years. Um, so we've gone through, we're frankly just at a different stage in that, in that conversation around port deepening. Um, other ports, like Charleston as an example, is just now starting that study process to figure out how they're going to expand and deepen their port. Uh, port of Miami and others are looking at, at similar processes. So I, short answer is I don't think that all the ports need to be deepened. I think all ports need improvements to be able to handle their customers more efficiently, whether it's inland infrastructure, whether it's new technology and cranes at the ports to be able to be more efficient. Some ports um, need better investment and more investment into their deepening. Savannah, that's, that's our Achilles heel, as I mentioned before. We're too shallow. We've made the billions of dollars of investment in technology and landside infrastructure and all the other elements to make it happen. Um, so I, I think that the investment in ports needs to be a scalpel approach again. Um, and I think you, know, you look at volume where the, the biggest impact will, will, will come forward from. So. All right, you, sir, will have the last question of this session. I'll, I'll be brief, and I'll try to be a, a little clearer than I was. Paige, the question is really for you. Um, you asked me about ports again? No, not about right. ports. Um, and I always joke with people, right, if you go see one port, you've seen one port. And if you go on a Monday, it's a different port than it is on a Tuesday, sure. depending on when the ships come in. Uh, my question to you is there's a lot of discussion about logistics centers and industry clusters and this integrated land use around freight villages and, and trying to put this concept of density in the freight system. Some of it's tied to railroad patterns, mm -hmm. as you saw in the Columbus area and different places like that. What is your thoughts on, does Georgia have that type of approach when they're looking at integrating land use and logistics clustering to help develop this velocity of, of freight moving within the system? Sure, yeah. I mean, we, we've got some interesting GIS maps that we've done as well where we look at this clustering approach of where these logistics providers are located. And, and you can certainly see where certain pockets are. And then from an economic development point of view, you ask the question, well, why are those clusters there? Some of them are easier answers. Well, we've got a big port in Savannah, and a large cluster of logistics providers there. Um, obviously, the Atlanta area, based on a lot of reasons, Columbus, the military base, Valdosta, and so on. Um, and, but then there's, there's questions if you look at that map and you see where there's not as many dots. And you ask your question, I think what you're asking is, why are there not more dots in, that, in those areas? Is it, a, is it an infrastructure issue? If we invested in more rail or more highway or improved certain things there, would it attract more of a cluster or grow the industry there? Is it a policy issue? Is it a tax issue? Is it a funding issue? Um, is it attracting a Home Depot to put a distribution center there and a cluster would grow around that? Um, I, I think those are conversations, those are conversations that we have with those communities with less dots. Um, but I, I don't think there's a single answer on how you can create more of those clusters. But it is certainly a conversation we have on you know, how do you leverage those clusters where they do exist? And, and frankly, how can you create new ones um, where there's less? All right, well, we're a couple minutes over time. I think it was well worth it. Uh, moderator's privilege, I guess, to overrun just a tiny bit. But let's thank both of these panelists. I think they did a fabulous job, and we're thrilled, uh, just thrilled that they would uh, invest their time to spend with us and to spend with you. And so, uh, Michelle and Paige, uh, can't thank you enough. We know you're incredibly busy. 
thank you. And this is also an investment in, uh, in that will benefit both of your organizations and your industries as well.